asking case study, donor summering in Maine, attribute, attentive, saying, shut up and listen, action step, listen to your donor, wait at least three beats after either of you speaks to give them a chance to answer and to elaborate if they wish. Many wealthy Philadelphians flee our steamy summers. They vacation on the cool and rocky coast of Maine, where I grew up. When visiting my family, I sometimes stopped to see a donor who'd become a friend. Amanda was a great gardener with a beautiful house and property by the sea. I called one year, hoping to schedule a visit, and found her distraught. What's the matter? I asked. Her lovely southern accent faltered. Finally, with a great deal of circumlocution, she wailed, Oh, Val, I feel as though I've been taken advantage of. What do you mean? Who was it? What did they do? I demanded. Slowly, I winkled the story out of her. It took a while because it wasn't a nice story, and she rarely spoke ill of anyone. Her husband had died of cancer the year before. She was intensely grateful to the fine medical team who had cared for him with skill, kindness, and respect. Like her, he was charming and remarkably uncomplaining. The staff had come to love him, further endearing them to her. She had been thinking of making a $5 million gift to the hospital in his memory, possibly endowing the planned cancer center. So when the hospital's development director called to ask if he could pay his condolences, she happily agreed. She tingled as she anticipated surprising him with her colossal gift. Amanda was disappointed that he came alone. None of the medical team that she knew and trusted had accompanied him. She toured him through her renowned garden before lunch, but he seemed distracted. She made polite conversation as the meal was served. True Southern ladies rarely discuss business over lunch, at least not before the second or third course. So she was startled when he launched into his spiel right away. He told her the hospital's fine staff needed funding for a new cancer center. She tried to share her ideas, but he talked right over her. He pulled out architect's sketches at the table and started describing needed facilities and equipment without a mention of the patients. When she tried to ask questions, he glared, silencing her with a firm, please don't interrupt. After several attempts, she gave up. She hid her hurt feelings by looking down at her meal which seemed to irritate him. His delicious lunch barely tasted. He completed his presentation. Don't you think you owe the hospital something for all we did for your husband? She had never met this man before and was sure he hadn't visited her husband, not once in the hundreds of hours she'd sat by a sickbed. She stammered that yes, of course she was grateful, but stopped, shocked as he slid a pledge card and pen across the table to her. The form was already filled out, indicating she would make a million-dollar gift. She signed, almost in tears. She'd planned to give five million dollars, but he'd stolen her delightful vision. She wanted to give those caregivers every bit of space, equipment, and support they needed. But she also wanted to share research on the healing gardens they could create. She knew how such gardens would freshen the air and lift the spirits, both within the hospital and outside it, along gently curving walkways. She signed, taking no joy in this cold transaction. He'd smashed her glorious memorial as a bully might kick apart a sandcastle on the nearby beach. She was heartbroken. I was speechless, appalled, and deeply grieved that her generous spirit had been so violated. She'd confided in me because she knew I'd understand her loss. In the past, we'd happily conspired on successful philanthropic projects, and she knew how fond I was of her husband. I visited her that summer, but we didn't speak of the incident. I admired her garden, and we shared a delicious lunch. Afterward, I helped her to a bench by the ocean. Together, we let its crashing waves soothe our spirits. It's easy to talk over a shy person, when you're anxious or excited. And yes, when asking for a gift, you talk about your nonprofit's impact and the resources it needs. But it's as important to listen as to speak, to listen deeply and listen well. Consider this. When did someone last listen to you with their whole being, totally attentive to your every word, 
When did you last get to think something through aloud and uninterrupted, of discovering your answer in the safe presence of a receptive listener? I suspect not too often. Besides, as the old saying goes, you learn more with your mouth shut than open. Elizabeth A. Dow, CEO and President of Leadership Philadelphia, offers the following tips for active listening. One, make it your sole agenda to understand the other person. Two, refrain from judging the person or their words. Three, do not try to solve their problem or fix them. Four, meet them where they are. Five, leave behind everything else going on in your life. Be there for them in that moment. If you can't remember all five, try two simple things. First, look into the speaker's eyes, and second, count three silent beats after they've spoken, but before you reply. Our modern Western culture abhors silence, so it may be a bit awkward at first. As you get more comfortable, you'll revel in the spaciousness of such discussions. You will learn more about others and help them discover for themselves what they think. You may also become very popular. Attentive listeners are rare, and we all want to be heard. Mother Teresa taught that we need silence to touch souls.